Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to worship this morning. I, uh, I draw your attention to the fact that bullet, in our bulletin, hold on, I'll wait. It's early. I want to draw your attention to the fact that over half of the bulletin is announcements. There's a lot going on and coming up. Uh, and there, they're going to be on the screen again when it comes down at the end of the service. Uh, please read all of these things. It would take longer than the sermon to read them all to you. I was waiting for someone to say, go ahead and read. I was really giving you the chance. I set you up for it and you missed it. So you're going to get a sermon now. That's all there is to it. Thank you. There's, there's a lot in here, all sorts of, of activities and concerts coming up. Uh, plant sales are coming up. It's spring. Spring has sprung. And so please read all of these. I'm not going to do it for you uh, because, frankly, it gets kind of boring after the third or fourth one. Take it home. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your bathroom mirror. No, please, somebody do that. I want to find out what that looks like, you know, what it feels like. Uh, anyway, please do that. Um, if it is a little warm in here, please understand. I want to explain. Our heating and cooling system here in this building have to be either heat or air conditioning. Now, we're going to be switching very, very soon to air conditioning, not to heat, but to air conditioning. So it's going to change the environment in here. Might be a little warm today for some of you. Next week it probably won't be, but we'll see. But when that happens, uh, it might be a little cool for a while until Mother Nature adjusts with us. Uh, but that's the way our system works. A lot like the public schools, they switch and it's, it's over. So be aware of that. Uh, just be patient. Uh, the weather will constantly change in Maryland, don't worry. It will never change like that. Um, right now, we'd like to prepare our hearts and minds for worship with this morning's prelude.
As you are able, please stand for our call to worship. The Lord our God is a welcoming God. The Lord our God is a seeking God. The Lord our God is a hearing God. The Lord our God is a loving God. Please be seated, and would the children like to join me here for a few moments with Toby Dog? I'm back. How you doing? Nice to see you. Good. Good. All right. Hey, what's up? Oh, bo oh, look at he's coming. Oh, you're tall. There you go. There we go. Oh, you got a dog. I like dogs. You know why I like dogs? I am one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a lick. You want a lick? You want a lick? Ah. Toby likes to lick. I'm sorry. I do. And Toby has a very uh, good reason why he likes to lick. He says there's a good reason. I think he gets a little carried away sometimes. Do you know, would you like to tell them why? I like to greet people. He likes to greet people. 
And when he greets people, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, he licks people. When, when you greet people, how do you greet people? You would? Shake their hand? That would be difficult for me. Well, you have paws. All right, here, let me shake your paw. Your paw looks funny. I'd rather lick him. I, I'm sure you would. Sometimes we shake hands or paws, as the case may be. Uh, are there other ways that you can greet people? Can you say anything to them when you greet them? Hello. What? Hello. Hello, how are you? Is there any, oh, you, that's what you say to people. Oh, keep up with us. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you were just saying hello. You could say hello, couldn't you? That's a nice way to greet people. Is there anything else you can do when you greet people that might make them feel welcome? What are you doing? I'm licking my paw. Why are you licking your paw? Because I can't reach that guy over there. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, just lay there for a minute. Is there anything else you might be able to do when you greet people to make them feel welcome? What? You could say, how you doing? I like that. Yeah, how you doing? Good? You want to lick? <laughs> ah, yeah. He always likes to say that after he licks someone. <laughs> yeah, he does that. Yeah, you could say, how are you doing? Like, how are you feeling today? Or something like that. Well, today, we're going to talk to everybody here while you're at faith time about greeting people and making them feel welcome. You know, you could do something else. What could you do? You could give them a milk bone. Do you think giving someone a milk bone would make them feel welcome? Well, you never greeted dogs before. You like milk bones, don't you? I do. It, it might be good for dogs, but not for people, huh? No. I, I don't think people would like, well, that's a good thing. Why is that good? That way there's more milk bones for me. All right, well, that would be a good thing for you. Well, we're going to talk to everybody up here today about greeting people and making them feel welcome in church. Uh, and it won't include milk bones, so don't even ask. Oh. All right, yeah. Well, boys and girls, it's time for faith time. Thank you all for being here and, and for being greeted by uh, Toby Dog. You make it okay? We are growing in love. Please join me for the prayer of illumination. Almighty God, your word is a precious gift to us. Open our hearts and prepare our minds to hear your word read and proclaimed in a way that is pleasing to you. Amen. Our epistle lesson today comes to us from Acts 3, 12 through 19. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by your own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him but you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, 
as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel lesson comes to us from Luke 24, 36 through B, through Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do, you, do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in, his, in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I took, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand these scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ.
July 4th, 1982. You remember what you were doing? I remember what I was doing that day. It had nothing to do with Independence Day and all of the celebrations of 4th of July. That was the first Sunday that I was going to be preaching in my first bishop's appointment as the pastor of churches. I was appointed to a six-point charge. I had six churches, three each Sunday, worship times 9, 10, and 11, and there was a 15-minute drive between them. Yeah. Yeah. The, the second two started without the pastor, and you walked in, and, and some of them finished without the pastor because I had to get out. My first church that morning at 9 o'clock was Santa Fe United Methodist. It's spelled Santa Fe, but in Tennessee it's pronounced Santa Fe. Just deal with it. The parsonage was kind of diagonal to the church, and it was a very short walk, but I knew I was going to have to jump in the car and get to the next church, which was Goshen. Well, I drove my car over and parked it so that I was going to be headed out, So I, because I knew I had to hurry. And I walked up to the front steps of the church, and there was a man there I had not met yet. I'd only been there three days, and I hadn't met him yet. Big man, over six feet tall. He was balding and kind of light gray hair and uh, glasses on. He looked like a heavy, hairy Truman. That's what he looked like. And he was waving to me as I got out of the car. And he said, morning, doll. Now, I hadn't been in Tennessee but one year, and I thought I knew the customs, but I thought, did he just call me doll? Well, I walked up the steps, and I took his hand, (laughs) <laughs> and I thought he was going to break my hand. And he started shaking it like he was campaigning for office. And he said, it sure is good to meet you, doll. And I said, well, it's good to meet you, sir. My name's Phil. And he said, well, I'm glad you're here, doll. Just about that time, a lady walked up the steps behind me with a great big old grin on her face. And she said, morning, daddy. Now, at this point, think about this. I have a man in front of me shaking my hand, calling me doll, and I've got a lady behind me calling me daddy. I did not turn around and say, who's your daddy? I did not ask that question. (laughs) But I, I didn't know quite what to make of this scene. Now, luckily, she kind of nodded to me and hugged this man and said, I love you, daddy. And I thought, oh, boy, that's good. I'm glad that's out of the way. Then I learned the man's name. His name was Horace Fox, F-O-X. And he was the greeter of that village, Santa Fe. He greeted everybody the same way, whether you were at the church or down at the post office. And that's about all there was in Santa Fe. That was the limit of the whole village. He looked at everybody and he said, morning, doll. It didn't matter if you were a mountain man who'd just come out of the hills of Tennessee, looked like Grizzly Adam and Sasquatch. He would greet you, howdy, doll. And they all loved it. That was Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox was a greeter. And he greeted people with something that... I'm not sure you can learn it. I think you just have to have it inside you to give away. He greeted people with sincere Christian love. That's what it was. When he said doll to men, women, children, I don't know if he said it to animals. I never heard that, but he probably did. He sincerely meant it. You were priceless to him, even if he never met you before. Morning, doll. Sure is good to see you, doll. He called me doll until I left that appointment two years later. Everybody loved Mr. Fox because Mr. Fox loved everybody else. And it didn't matter if he agreed with your theology or your politics or whether you cheered for Vanderbilt or Tennessee. Now, down in that state, that can be an interstate civil war. I just want you to know that. Mr. Fox loved people. He was a disciple. 
and disciples demonstrate, physically demonstrate extravagant hospitality. That congregation down in Santa Fe, I, I, I was new to ministry. I mean, it was my first appointment. I didn't know what to expect. The Sunday before Christmas, they showed me hill country Tennessee hospitality and love. I got back from the three sermons that I gave that morning, and I got to the front door of the Parsons, and there was a big old cardboard box there filled with food, hill country food, bread that you're not supposed to eat because it's not good for you, uh, cured meats that doctors will say aren't good for you, but boy, they sure do taste good, and canned goods. And now remember, I was a student in divinity school. We didn't have any money. And getting a box of food, it was one of the most amazing Christmas gifts I've ever received. Because I knew they gave it to me not only out of my need, but out of their love and concern. It was sincere, it was true, and I was overwhelmed with their hospitality. Disciples demonstrate in their lives extravagant hospitality. How we greet people here in the church is one thing. Of course, we want to be good greeters and hosts in the church. But how do we greet people when we're standing at line at Walmart complaining about the self-checkout? Because there's a lot of people complaining at Walmart about self-checkout. There's a lot of people complaining about self-checkout. Doesn't matter where you go. My mother doesn't drive anymore, but she still complains about pumping your own gas. That was a bad thing. How do we demonstrate hospitality in the world? Being a disciple is not just a congregational thing that we, we do within the bounds of this building or this facility. Discipleship is a way of life. So wherever we go, with whom we are in the presence of, no matter what we say, it must be guided by discipleship, a disciple of Jesus Christ. The risen Christ commissioned the disciples. The risen Christ. If, if you recall the gospel lesson that was shared with you, it says he opened their minds. Think about that for a moment. They had spent perhaps three years following this man from place to place. They were with him day and night. They, they watched him perform miracles. They heard him preach. They had one-on-one -on -one time with his teaching. But it wasn't until after the resurrection that their minds were opened. Their hearts might have been opened, but their minds became opened with that risen Savior. What's keeping our minds closed as disciples? Hospitality reveals our mindset. Are we able to open our minds enough to hear the person who walks in the door, what they have to say, what their story is, what the baggage is that they're carrying around in life? And folks, everybody here has baggage. We also know that there's plenty of room for more people to bring more baggage in. But do people understand that, that in the midst of this congregation, you can bring the baggage with you. That's fine, because we got plenty of it to share. And it'll all fit comfortably. Are our minds open enough to receive guests with extravagant hospitality? Because that is something that Christ demands of disciples. Some people have a hard time coming to church because of past incidents or uh, rumors or things that they've heard about the church, misunderstandings perhaps, or actual facts that they can't get past. They have a hard time. In other words, some people don't trust that easily. 
That's why I'm wearing the cross around my neck that I have today and this stole. It is Native American Ministry Sunday where we remember all of the work among Native Americans, with Native Americans, and the blessings that Native Americans have shared with the world. But this cross is kind of important to me. I was the, the first person to chair the Native American Ministries Committee for our conference way, way back in the early 90s, 1990s. I just, there's some younger folk up here, I want to make sure they know that. And one of the things that, that I learned there is we, we gathered and talked and learned from Native Americans how the church could support them and enhance their already beautiful ministries was that there was a guy I really needed to talk to because he had been a United Methodist pastor and he just happened to be the chief of the Yakagani River Band of the Shawnee. And he lived in Maryland. Now, I became friends with one of the Shawnee from that band who lived up on Boonesboro, Billy Old Dog. I'll tell you about Billy some other time. Billy was a piece of work. Billy said, you need to meet Chief Raincrow. And I said, sure. What's his phone number? He said, no, that's not how it works. He said, you have to call someone who will call the chief, and he'll call you. I said, I'm not talking about the godfather, Billy. I'm talking about whoever you said, Rain Crow. And he said, you got to deal with this. See, the chief, as a United Methodist pastor, ordained in Pennsylvania, the chief was very, very nervous of people in the church. There was a price on his head. A price. Because he took a stand against organized gambling in the state of Maryland. He didn't want casinos on Native American land, and the Shawnee have a lot of land out west, and gamblers want it on there. And he took a stand and said, no, you're not building it on Shawnee land. So they put a price on his head, and he was in hiding in Maryland in a nearby town. Well, after a few weeks, the guy that I had called had called Rain Crow, and I got a phone call one day, and it was Chief Rain Crow. He said, I'm Rain Crow. I want to talk. So we talked on the phone, and it came to a close, and he said, okay, well, I'll call you sometime. And I said, oh, okay, and he hung up. That was it. This went on for about three months. I get a phone call out of the blue. It'd be him. We'd talk a few minutes. He'd say, I'll call you sometime. And finally, one day, he called, and I picked up the phone, and he said, when are we going to get together? And I said, uh, whenever you tell me, which was the right answer, by the way. And so we set the date, and I said, Chief, I don't know where I'm going. Can you tell me? And that's when he finally gave me his address. It was in Silver Spring. Go figure. Uh, and... Uh, my son Justin, or he, Justin was in elementary school, and I said, uh, would it be possible that I bring uh, my young son with me? And he said, absolutely, I love kids, bring your son. So I said, all right. So we, the day came, we, we had a traditional appropriate gift to present to the, the chief, to Rain Crow. My son would give him that gift in the Shawnee way, and we arrived at his house. The door opened and there was a young man with blonde hair and blue eyes, which did not fit my picture of Shawnee, who opened the door and said, you're the preacher. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I'm Crow. Dad's in here. Come on. I felt like I was walking in to meet Don Corleone. I really did. We went in and uh, I, he was sitting there. He had long gray hair that was pulled back in a, a ponytail. And beyond that, there was nothing unique about it. But he just sat in the chair and looked at us. I kind of elbowed my son Justin, and he walked over and presented the gift to him. And Rain Crow took it, inspected it, and said, have a seat, my friend. And that was it. We were friends. We had our talk. Then he gave me this cross. He said, my son Crow made that. And he said, 
I think it's a good cross. I want you to have it. So I wear this to remember his hospitality. He was afraid of me because he was afraid I would give away his secret whereabouts through the church and he would die. Now he has long since died a natural death. And his son assumed his name as Rain Crow, the new chief of the Yakagani River Band. But I still wear the cross, made by Crow, but given to me by Rain Crow. Because he looked at me and said, welcome, my friend. And we were friends for good. I could call him whenever I wanted directly now. I didn't have to go through Michael Corleone or whoever. And he would sometimes advise me on spiritual concerns that I had or questions I had. He would school me on Native American spirituality, and we would talk. And every time we talked on the phone, he said to me, it's good talking to you, my friend. And we'd hang up. Hospitality. That was Shawnee hospitality. It was a certain way of doing things. But what is our hospitality as Christians? Have we ever really thought about that? Is it whoever comes in can go in the uh, Cafe Connection and have a cookie? Which is not a bad thing, don't get me wrong. But is there more? Do people understand this is a safe place for them? In this world, we need safe places to be who we are. That is hospitality, the discipleship way. And that's what we're asking everyone to study, to learn, to grow into. There is a rule in coaching, life coaching. The coach doesn't have to fix the person they're coaching. You don't have to do that. In fact, you can't fix them. All you can do is help them discover who they are and what they are called to do in their life. That is what coaching means. I think Christianity and discipleship is very similar. We are not called to meet people at the door and say, let me give you a list of what you're doing wrong. (sighs) If they ever did that with me, I'd never make it in the door. Our job is to meet people at the door and say, we've been waiting for you to come. We've missed you. Welcome home. And what's your name? Because you see, the name, has no, it has nothing to do with it. It's about welcoming a child of God, our brother or our sister, and saying, we are so glad you're here hospitality. We must grow in that, all of us. And it means that we must open our minds as well as our hearts and say to everyone we encounter here and out there, it sure is good to see you, friend. And God loves you. Amen.
Please be seated. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. We come before you again, O Lord. Easter seems like a distant memory. And yet, today, you remind us that Christ is risen. Indeed, Christ is risen. And we offer you thanks and praise for your superabundance of grace in our lives. Oh, we are plagued with headlines. We are plagued with commercials on television and through media of all the bad in the world, with all of the corruption and unlawfulness in the world, all of the pain and grief that the world experiences. And so often those things take over our minds and close us off to your grace and abiding love. So open our minds, O God, as you open our hearts and allow your grace to flood in upon us, lifting us up, turning our face towards you rather than towards the ways of the world. We struggle to be your disciples, O Lord. But we know that you walk with us, that your spirit rests upon us. We know that Pentecost is just around the corner. At the same time, your spirit is already here. We hold before you the hurting of this world, the pain experienced in the lives of brothers and sisters around this globe. Wars erupting and rumors of wars. And so often we feel despair when we should feel your joy. We pray this day for all of that suffering. We pray for the leaders of our country. We pray for leaders of countries around the world. We pray that your spirit of peace of hope, of shalom, will reign supreme. Walk with us, O God, as individuals, as a community of faith. Walk with us as we seek to be truly disciples who share your extravagant hospitality. We offer our prayer to you this day in the name of Christ, our risen Savior, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Last night I lay my sleeping there.
Please join with me in our offertory prayer. Thank you, extravagant God, for your blessings in our lives. We offer ourselves in grateful response, seeking to live with such compassion toward others that your blessings will flow through us to bless our community and our world. For the sake of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. to say something to the folks watching on YouTube. It's good to see you. And we're glad you're here. We're glad you're with us. Uh, we hear from folks on YouTube. We, we do listen. Uh, some of them want to hear more postlude. So, so shh, a little bit, because you know, we hear about them. Keep emailing, keep calling. Let us know 
what you think, what's going on in your lives. We're all family. It's time to go show the world that we're family. Those of us who are in this building today, those of us who are on the internet, it's time to go be disciples. Demonstrate God's extravagant hospitality. Go now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.